Alright guys, here we have a well-insulated turbine operating at a steady state, developing 28.75 megawatts of power for steam flowing through it with a rate of 50 kilograms per second. Uh, we have the steam's pressure and velocity at the inlet, as well as the quality, pressure, and velocity at the exit. We have no potential energy, and we have to determine the inlet temperature in degrees Celsius. So very quickly, I have my uh, turbine here, and I have at the inlet the pressure, velocity, and we have the unknown temperature. We're working with water, and then because it's adiabatic, we have no heat transfer, zero kilowatts of heat transfer. We have the power, 28.75 megawatts, which is 28,750 kilowatts with the mass flow rate, and then we have these properties at the exit. So I guess that the approach I would use for this problem is... Well, I see that I have the velocity here and here, so we're probably going to be using the kinetic energy here. And then I have the pressure at the inlet, and I have two conditions. So I have the um, saturated vapor state and the pressure at the exit. So I can probably pull the enthalpy here, and I can solve for the enthalpy here. And if I solve for the enthalpy, because we also have the, the work and heat transfer, I should be able to interpolate to the temperature. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's begin by writing out the energy balance equation over a single inlet, single exit control volume. So basically, you have zero equals the heat transfer minus the power plus the mass flow rate times what comes in minus what comes out. So you have the change in enthalpy. So you have H1 minus H2, inlet minus exit. And then you have the kinetic energy, which is V1 minus V2 squared divided by 2. Just remember that kinetic energy is 1 over 2 mv squared. That's where this comes from. And then we have the potential energy, which is, if you remember, mgz. So we have the m mass flow rate times g in difference in z height here. But we can cancel a few things out here because we know that the heat transfer equals zero. So let's cross that out. And we know that the potential energy is also zero. So let's cancel that out as well. Therefore, you can simplify that energy balance equation to zero equals negative work, or sorry, negative power, plus the mass flow rate times the difference of enthalpy plus the kinetic energy. So now let's plug in what we have. Once again, remember, we're going to look for H1 because then we can combine that enthalpy plus the pressure to find the temperature. So we have zero equals negative, and then we'll insert the power here, which was 28,750 kilowatts, plus the mass flow rate, which was 50 kilograms per second, times, now we're going to do the change in enthalpy, so we have H1 as an unknown, minus H2 H2, we're going to pull from the properties table. So I'm going to turn to table A3. We'll go to 0 0.06 bar of pressure. And we're going to look for the Hg because we have a x equals 1 saturated vapor. And we have 2567.4 kilojoules per kilogram. So let's go ahead and fill that into our equation here. So we have minus 2567.4 kilojoules per kilogram. That's H2 plus the velocity, so we have V1 squared. So with V1, we had 61 meters per second. So we have 61 squared minus V2, which was 130 squared divided by two, and close the brackets. And then let's just make sure that we're adding consistent units here. Before we start adding these numbers in and solving for the enthalpy, you have to make sure that you add a conversion factor because the velocity is in meters per second. So let me explain. So for our power, we have kilowatts. That's our unit for power here, which if you break that down, that is a kilojoule per second, which if you remember, a joule or a kilojoule would be 1,000 times a joule divided by seconds. And then now we can break down a joule. So a joule is a Newton meter. So we have newton meter per second, or 1,000 newton meters per second, because you have a prefix of kilo. And then if you remember from Newton's first law, a newton is just a kilogram, which is mass times acceleration, kilogram times meter per second squared. So essentially you have this newton here, times a meter, divided by a second, and multiplied by 1,000. So this is what a kilowatt breaks down to in SI units. And if you simplify this out, it would be 1,000 kilogram meter squared per second cubed. So in other words, 
whatever comes out of this expression here has to be consistent with this because you can't add x plus y. You have to add x plus x. So let's go ahead and look and see what we have over here. So right over here, we have a kilogram per second. And here we have a kilojoule. So I'll write that out, actually. We have a kilogram per second. And here we have a kilojoule per kilogram plus meter squared per second squared. So first, we'll, di we'll distribute this out over here. And if you do, then you're going to have kilogram kilojoule per second kilogram, cross out those kilograms, and you have a kilojoule per second, which you know is kilowatts, so that's good. Now, if you distribute out to the velocity, you'll have kilogram meter squared per second cubed. Now, this expression here is pretty close to this over here, but notice you're actually missing the 1,000, and that's because this is actually a kilowatt, and this over here is just simply a watt. So you need to convert from watts to kilowatts. And to do that, all you have to do is divide by 1,000. So if you just divide by 1,000, you add a conversion factor of divided by 1,000. So therefore, to the velocity, we must multiply by 1 over 1,000 to reach kilowatts. So now we have a unit of kilowatts for our power, a unit of kilowatts for our enthalpy difference times mass flow rate, and a unit of kilowatts for our velocity times mass flow rate. So let's go ahead and close out the bracket here. And now we can just solve for H1. And if you solve correctly, you should have the H1 equals 3148.99 kilojoules per kilogram. And you know this does make sense because an enthalpy is typically going to be higher before going through a turbine because a turbine is just an energy extractor. So it's going to extract enthalpy out of here and that's why a turbine will actually produce power rather than consume power, and you're going to have a lesser enthalpy on the right side of the turbine. But yeah, now that we have our specific enthalpy and we have our pressure, now we can finally find the temperature at state 1. So, at P1 equals 25 bar, and H1 equals 3148.99 kilojoules per kilogram. Let's check what our phase state is. Likely superheated if we're entering a turbine. We'll go back to table A3, go over to 25 bar, and we'll check what the saturated vapor specific enthalpy is, and it looks like it's 2803.1. So since we're beyond that, we're at 3148, we're in the superheated region. So now what we need to do is we need to go to the superheated table and check 25 bar and 3148.99 kilojoules per kilogram of specific enthalpy to find T1. So the superheated table A4 has 20 bar and 30 bar, but it unfortunately does not have 25 bar. So this is probably going to be the most difficult part of the problem because you're going to have to interpolate more than once. So the way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to find what the temperatures are at... 3148.99 kilojoules per kilogram of specific enthalpy for both 20 bar and 30 bar since we have 25 bar. So if you look at 20 bar, 3148.99 is going to be between these two numbers and these two temperatures. And then for 30 bar, we're going to be between these two numbers and therefore these two temperatures. So at P equals 20 bar, we have a temperature column and an enthalpy column. So we're going to have 320 degrees Celsius. We'll have our temperature at T20, which should be at our specific enthalpy of 3148.99. We'll have our 360 and 3159.3 kilojoules per kilogram. I also forgot the 320 corresponds with 3069. 0.5 kilojoules per kilogram. And so when you interpolate this, you'll have that T of 20 bar equals 355.4 degrees Celsius. So now I'm going to interpolate at P equals 30 bar. 
So again, we have a temperature and enthalpy column. So we'll have 360 T30 and 400. And the enthalpies will, will correspond as 31, 38.7. And I'm just pulling this from the table that I boxed. We'll have 31, 48. 0.99 and again that's our enthalpy that we have and the temperature that we're looking for and we have 32 30.9 corresponding with 400 degrees celsius so now when i interpolate for t30 i'll have that t30 equals 364.46 degrees celsius so basically now i have both of these numbers here so now i can fix my table at the enthalpy that we have, which is 3148.99. And now I have two temperatures at 20 bar and 30 bar, so I can now just interpolate for 25 bar. So now, once again, we'll say at H equals 3148.99 kilojoules per kilogram. Just like how up here we fixed at the, temp at the pressure, we're going to fix at the enthalpy, and we'll have a P in T column. So we'll have 20 bar, 25 bar, and 30 bar. And then that'll correspond with the temperatures above. We have 355.4, 364.46. And then we're going to have our T1 here. So I'll, I'll just call it T25, I guess, for now. And when I interpolate for it, I'll have that T25, which I guess is equal to T1 in the problem statement equals 359.93 degrees Celsius. So that's your final answer. You have T1 equals 359.93 degrees Celsius.